Well, there is a reason that KETV Channel 7 has dominated in the ratings for many, many years here in the Omaha, Nebraska market. A big part of that is you don't achieve that kind of success without a great leadership team. And sports anchor Andy Kendi is one of those leaders. And I figured everyone can learn about his leadership, the team's leadership at KETV Channel 7 as well. But you're also going to learn about Andy's perseverance. Two years he went, two years graduating from college without a job, but he stuck with it, never gave up, and it found his way into two Sportscasters of the Year Award here in Nebraska, as well as the coveted Oscar Awards, which is provided by the Omaha Sports Commission. This episode is chock full of lessons, leadership lessons specifically, like what is paramount in looking for talent when they go to hire, and so many other things that I promise you you're going to learn about from his days growing up in the Chicago area. Please give this a listen. Uh, I had a ball with Andy Kindy of Channel 7. Well, this is going to be a wide-ranging interview. Andy Kindy from KETV Channel 7. I, the, the, the biggest thing that, that has me so intrigued is Dancing with the Stars. I get, a, I get a work with a guy today who has covered Dancing with the Stars. So we're going to get to that in a minute. Yep. But before we do, uh, look, the show is Leadership Lessons from Mayberry. And we love to start with what your Mayberry is. And I can't wait to hear because for you, you've got a couple of options. So what do you consider your hometown and, and what was it like? Give me some influences for well, you growing I, up. I moved, up uh, I moved during my high school years. So that is a tough time as an adolescent kind of finding your way. So really, I have two hometowns. But growing up, that really established the foundation was in Arlington Heights, Illinois. And that's right outside Chicago, northwest suburb. It's the home of Arlington Park, which is rumored to be the next Bears home. But now there's some some flies in that ointment. But uh, And a former racetrack, and a right? a former racetrack. We would yeah. go see the horses like once or twice a year. So it, it was uh, – that is – home base for for me uh, you know uh, my, we moved out to new york um new jersey uh when my dad uh, my dad got transferred out there when i right before my sophomore year in high school so a tough time to move as a kid trying to play sports and kind of fit in but uh yeah the first 14 plus years of my life were in, in arlington heights and then i spent about uh f- my family spent about five years out in new jersey and then when i decided when it was came time for me to go to college so i only spent three years out there and then came back to the midwest and went to wisconsin because i really wanted to go to a big 10 school so yeah. that in wisconsin was it and by the way wisconsin is not the wisconsin of now back then <laughs> they had uh, i was i endured the don morton era so, uh, so Barry Alvarez not there yet. Uh, he was there my senior year and went one and ten. So my four years of undergrad, uh, I got to watch the Badgers win seven games in four <laughs> years. So this little hiccup that Nebraska's going through, that's that's nothing. I was just going to say my kids can relate. Yes. They, they still don't believe how good we were right. in the 90s. Right. And I'm like, guys, trust me, it was a golden era, 90s, 80s, and even right. 70s. But, you know, Andy, I've talked to so many business owners uh, since I started the show. And they all seem to have grown up in a small town. Mm-hmm. And they tell me these stories, you know, farm communities, they've got all this land to run around, play football games. What was it like in a more suburban setting? Like oh, as a 12 year old yeah. kid in the middle of a, a June day, yeah. what could you do? Oh, this is a great question. And, and I got an answer. We had a, a, a neighborhood park across the street, Evergreen Park, which is right on the corner of uh, Gibbons, uh, across the street from my house, um, which was 409 South Gibbons. Still, you can still remember the address, right? <laughs> Probably the phone number. Yeah, too, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. <laughs> yeah, three one two two five nine four five six. I knew. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, it it is one of these deals where every day you would you didn't even have to call people. Everybody knew at about ten o'clock in the morning. Everybody would gather in the summer. It's baseball time, and we play baseball. Uh, it was on just concrete blacktop uh because there were were hoops set up but we would play these makeshift tennis ball baseball games we would keep stats wear the helmets we'd go out and buy the three dollar you know now they're not three bucks but you know two three dollar helmets plastic helmets and you would you know put the numbers on the back it was great we'd play there all day sometimes we'd go home for lunch sometimes we'd keep going i mean i'm sure i've got sun damage from those years because we didn't (laughs) believe in sunscreen back then but yeah that was that was it but it was every day we played baseball out there and no matter what and some days 
10 kids showed up and some days 20 kids showed up and it was, it was, it was pretty amazing. You know, we also think a lot about football in this state as you, as you have covered so well over the years, but what was it like pick up football games? Could you do that as well? Yeah. Was that oh, yeah. was that legendary? In, so Evergreen in had a, a basketball court which you, we used as a, a, a makeshift baseball uh, diamond. They had a park for the kids, and then they had a real baseball diamond where I played little league, and then a, a big field which was the outfield. And that we used a couple when we wanted to go big, we'd have a big football field out <laughs> in the outfield. If we wanted to go small, there was a little small patch of grass in between the blacktop. And I mean, all this stuff is like <laughs> like yesterday. Oh, it's so, ingrained, yeah. yeah. And, and and again, pick up football, get the kids from the neighborhood everybody would show up and sometimes it would be tackle and sometimes we'd wear helmets and and i was a bigger kid now i i, I stopped growing when i was about seventh grade so i hit my growth spurt pretty early i nobody wanted to tackle me That's listen i saw your right. twitter photo yeah. Yeah. and uh, yeah. you're you've got shoulder pads on so, the green jersey what in the world was okay. that and what'd okay. you play all right so i was an offensive lineman in fact i was such a big kid that um in fourth and fifth and sixth grade seventh grade eighth grade before high school uh, they had a thing where you had to get weighed. Talk about giving a kid a complex. <laughs> you had to get weighed, and if you were over a certain amount, you got a stripe on your helmet. And then if you were over a certain uh, additional amount, you had a double stripe, a big X on your helmet, which meant if you touched the football, the ball was dead. That was to protect the other kids, and I was a double striper from day one. And so one, one game, fifth, sixth grade, I blocked a punt, ball dead after I scooped and scored. So here I am, I'm fifth grade, I'm, I scored a touchdown for my hometown Steelers and, and I, I don't get credit for it. No, it goes back to the 15. See, so this is, these are scarring memories yes, right here. I still remember. Yeah. In fact, it got so bad I mean, that in like eighth grade, I would just go to the to the to the to the scale and put one foot on and would just go boink. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I tell Rob McCartney this all the time. You know, I was like, I was 240 in seventh grade. I weigh less now than I did in seventh grade. So I was a big kid. In the picture you saw on Twitter, so they had this competition, pump, pass, and kick. Oh, yeah. Got, and you yeah. and I got to hear about this because yeah, so I know you qualified. Eighth, uh, eight-year-old and 10-year-old, I made it to the national semifinals. Uh, and you represent your hometown team. So you got to c participate and compete at a Bears game. And then you went on to, to go to the champion or the semifinals, which was at in Tampa Bay. I mean, Tampa Bay expansion team. I was, you know, I was wide eyed. It was oh. amazing. And, you know, the first year when I in 77, the Bucks were so bad. They had never won a home game until the day we showed up and they won their first home game. And I got to see it. And then two years later, they're competing for the NFC championship under Doug Williams. So those are the kind of the cool memories that, that, that you guys established. And my dad was along. My parents were along for the ride. My dad got to go to Tampa, but everybody. Everybody got to go to uh, the Chicago competitions, and that was during the years of Walter Payton and terrible quarterback play, but Walter Payton was my guy. Well, listen, if you qualify at that level, you could throw. You were yeah. a lineman who could throw, yeah. and yeah. I bet you were just – you were one of those linemen constantly saying to the coach, come on. Give me the ball. I, yeah. Just once. I was the fridge before the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, you you got about as far. I mean, to get to the you know the Tampa and the NFL Stadium, what an experience! But I have to imagine this all played in to where what drove you to, to deciding what you wanted to do. But everyone seems to be when they're young, they want to be a play by play guy. Mm -hmm. Was that you, or yeah. did you know sports casting? Was well, it? no. Originally, I wanted to be the voice of the Chicago Cubs. So I grew up with Jack Brickhouse and Lou oh Boudreau, and then and then before this is before Harry Carey moved over because Harry Carey did the Sox for years, the White Sox, and before that he did the Cardinals, obviously. But um, but I wanted to be Jack Brickhouse, Lou Boudreau. My mom would tell stories um, that when I was a kid, I'd race home because they played in the afternoon, no lights. And I would I would watch the end of the game and cry every time they lost. So I cried a lot as a kid. I was a little baby <laughs> because they, they they the Cubs were terrible back then in the in the mid to late seventies. Um, but yeah, I I always wanted to be uh, a play by play guy. And then once I got a little older, you know, uh, I got to you know I watched nightly news. Sports was the favorite. It was always after weather. And so I got to watch a lot of the Chicago sports guys, guys like Tim Weigel and Johnny Morris and those guys. And uh, later in life, Mark Gian Greco. And they really kind of planted the seeds. In fact, um, a little. Uh, my path went from Madison, Wisconsin to Milwaukee to Omaha. And when I was in Milwaukee, right after I started, I had a mutual friend that knew Tim Weigel and he, they were looking for a, a sports person. And I actually got to talk on the phone, like a little interview with Tim Weigel because they were just, he was kicking the tires to see if I'd be interested. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Absolutely, it was. I was one of those moments. Like I, I can't believe I'm talking to Tim Weigel, but uh, yeah, he's he's one of the legendary um, sports guys that I just 
absolutely, well, he was my idol. And the, the reason why I loved him so much, it wasn't just about, hey, who won, who lost, but he made it fun. He had these things called Weigel Wieners, and it was a big hot dog, and he would and he would show something goofy at the end. And a lot of that I try to instill today. So that's that's a lot of the influences. You take little bits and pieces of people that you like along. And I think that's true sure. in anything. Oh, when yeah. you go up the ranks in any form of business, you take characteristics that you like in, in, in leaders and maybe some that you don't think is that important and maybe those get kind of pushed aside, mm-hmm. but then you've got to gravitate to the things that work for you. Yeah, well, they always say steal from the best, right? Yeah, and certainly yeah. in business, that's done a lot. But what was that moment that it clicked for you? When did you know this was not just some passing interest as a kid that you were kind of fascinated with that you said, this is what I'm going to do? When did that click well, for you? I was a college kid at the University of Wisconsin, and uh, it was my junior year, and I was it was time to get an internship at the local television station. And my first semester doing that was my second semester junior year. So uh, my boss, one of my great friends, Jay Wilson, who is a legend in Madison, um, Jay, at the end of that first semester, I was a terrible intern. You know, looking back, I was awful. I would blow off shifts because I had a lot going on as a college kid and whatever. It was tough to get to the station, blah, blah. Made all the excuses you could as a college kid, right? And at the end of the semester, he gave me the speech that I later learned was like the speech. Hey, thank you for your service. You know, we're going to go in another direction. And back in those days, you can you could intern for free for as long as you wanted, as long as you were a good worker. Well, I was not a good worker. And I said, I will do anything because I had already planned on staying in the summer, really digging my heels into the internship, blah, blah, blah. He gave me the speech and I was like, I will do anything. Like, I'll work weekends. I'll work Sunday mornings. You tell me what. And he goes, OK, you can work weekends. So he put me with the weekend guy. Oh, I won't name, but it was it was an interesting time, and and uh, it was a it showed me a lot of things that really you need to do to be a successful or not successful broadcaster, and that was the, the moment where I'm like, hey, if I'm serious about this, I got to go. And so I interned from the the second semester of my junior year, so a year and a half of college, and then two years plus after that to try to get my first job. So there's like a period of three years of free internship that I did to try to chase after the dream because back in those days and people will remember the old guys like me and yourself you know (laughs) we remember days with pre-internet there were three stations in town fox didn't exist you had three if you were lucky three stations in town so maybe two sports people per station so you do the math 200 plus markets in the country there was only like you know there weren't that many jobs in local television so Finally, when I got one, I said, this is what I want to do. And so I think a long answer, but that's where it clicked. Yeah. And do you remember the old editing you had to do back yeah, in the day? When you said, oh, you my bet. golly. Yeah. That I was, was a three quarter. We, I started. People don't remember this, but, you know, when, when you shoot video, you, you guys, um, these cameras are about the size of my hand. Back then, you had a camera and then you had a battery pack that you were tethered to an umbilical, literally called an umbilical cord. That's what we <laughs> called it. That connected to your battery pack that had the physical tape in there. And it was it wasn't. It, we've come a long way. Oh, baby. absolutely. Yeah. And of course, yeah, cameras are a little bit smaller. Yeah, right there. yeah. and better, cleaner, <laughs> crisper. You can yeah. do a lot more things. Picture it looks yeah. much better. Let's go back to Arlington Heights because mm-hmm. obviously your mom, uh, a teacher, obviously a giver. Mm-hmm. Um, every teacher, my wife's a teacher, so I, I can relate to that world. Your dad is CPA. Yeah. What was their influence on you? Did they did they encourage and support? Did they think it was a pipe dream? What did they? No, no, no. They were they were all for it. They were all for it. And my dad really instilled the the love of sports into all of us. I have four siblings, two older brothers, two younger sisters. There was a competition going on, and still, it's funny because all the spouses we're, we're, we get together once a year at least, if not twice. We have a pretty close family, and um, the, the spouses just kind of roll their eyes like, "Here we go at the candy competitions <laughs> again," because we compete for everything we have checkers tournaments and you know you go on we're going to the beach in a couple of weeks and we're going to have a, a a bags tournament we already got the you know the stuff like that oh so, yeah i love it so and, and you know my dad worked a ton but he still made time to, to come to games and take us to ball games we go to cubs games white Sox games bears games he would get tickets from his uh, his 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 firm and every kid got to go to one game every year to just watch the bears play and that was so cool and my mom god bless her um they had she had to keep everything in control i mean five kids back then you know 
both obviously smoked <laughs> just to keep to keep themselves sane at that point. Calm they didn't know they little. didn't know any better, right? I mean, nobody did. Um, but she was she was something else to try to keep everybody in line, and and it was it was yeah it was great it was it was a great deal. And um, a quick story it was, it was funny because my parents love uh, they they passed two years ago. My mom passed. Um, I was the last thing uh, with my mom sitting in her hospital room. The last thing we did together as uh, son and, and and mom, we watched the, the Chiefs Browns game playoff game a couple years ago in her hospital room, and I was like, ah, this is. This is pretty amazing, and she was drifting in and out. But it was it was a, a lasting lasting memory. My dad passed like seven weeks later, and it was kind of joke in our family. Like people are like, "Oh, it's so awesome! You're how romantic! Your dad couldn't wait for you, you know, to be with your mom." I'm like, "No, nah, my mom is like, really, Don? <laughs> you couldn't last seven weeks on Earth without me? Like one of these deals?" So, yeah, well, what a union! There's no doubt about it. I, I've got to ask you though. Um, you know, when you think about growing up, you were the middle of five. Oh, yeah. And I'm hammering for attention. I have yet to meet a <laughs> yeah. middle child. Yeah. I think they're the most the most interesting because you got to get along with those older. Uh-huh. You got to get along with those younger. They're honor as hell, to be mm-hmm. honest with you. Mm-hmm. But they also have this ability, it seems like, to go out in the world and get along with everyone and connect with everyone because they've had to. Wow. And like you said, fight for attention a little bit. Do you agree with that little pot, uh, pop psychology uh, uh, sure, I've got here? I think to a point, I don't know if it's a blanket statement for all middle childs, but I know my middle, our Sammy, um, I have three daughters, and my middle is is like that. She gets along with, with you know, and... And not, while there's friction, of course, with any family, I think you do have to get along with the, the people who are a little older and, of course, kind of connect with the people that are a little younger. I had a four-year separation between me and my next brother and then two-year separation to my younger sister. So, yeah, um, yeah uh, they uh, it was an interesting dynamic for no doubt. And it was a crazy time. I mean, I, I just... I. I think back at some of the family dinners and stuff, and we're throwing stuff, and we had <laughs> stupid traditions. And but you know, like you said, the Mayberry thing—it oh. it really it takes you back. Yeah, it does. And and amazing parents. Now, here's one thing though: I've got to ask you, your dad. You're yeah. going into your junior year. You touched on it earlier. And he says, look, I, I've got to move to New Jersey. Sophomore year. Oh, going After into your sophomore- freshman oh, year. Oh, so I've got yeah. So tough time. Yeah, yeah. Do you look back on that time with great? you know, with happiness or resentment? How do you look back on that time? Because that had to be hard for you. To steal a Mike Riley line, it was a mixed bag. (laughs) It was a mixed bag. Um, You know, looking back, I think it it helped force me to kind of acclimate to a new surroundings. I mean, kids are kids, but East Coast kids are a little different from Midwest kids. They had different priorities, different. They ran at a different speed type of thing um, socially. And uh, it was a tough time to make it even uh, a little more difficult for me is the high school I was moving into was a three year high school. So they had two middle schools feeding into the high school. So I was kind of lost in the shuffle because the one middle school said, you know, I don't know anybody. He must be from the other middle school. You know, one of those deals. Yeah, yeah. But the thing that helped me, and it goes back to sports, is I played football. And I was a big kid as a sophomore, made the varsity, instantly made a circle of friends, and that. I mean, sports is the great connector, whether you you're, you excel or not. It gives you structure. It gives you uh, forces you to, to to play by the rules and have discipline. Which that is why I uh, tried to instill in my kids the importance of any type of team sport. And, and my younger girls are dancers. And yes, I have gravitated to yes, dancing. No question <laughs> is a sport because I see how hard those kids oh, work. Without a doubt. And, and swimming. And I know your swimming. daughters are, my, yeah. my oldest was a swimmer. And um, yeah, so I, I just think the, 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 the sporting element really helped in that transition. Yeah. And, and I want to talk about that and bring that up a little later when we talk about mm-hmm. KETV, because there's no doubt about it. I look at that as a fine tuned team. But before we get there, let's start now. You're in New Jersey, and it's time to go to college. And I don't know if you were being humble on your email to me or not, but you said it was one of the few schools that accepted you. Well, yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. Were you being humble? Because uh, I can't believe that. No, I, I, I was being actually honest. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, there was a bunch of uh, Big Ten schools I didn't get into. My, my, I really wanted to go to Illinois. My, my parents met there. They both went to Illinois. My, my dad went, uh, grew up in Champaign. My grandfather was a professor there for years, and I did not get in, and it was crushing. I was, mm-hmm. I was crushed. And that was always my dream. And so I started looking at other, uh, other 
uh, schools and what have you. And, and just, by the way, was, let me interrupt. Why yeah. the Big Ten? Why were you so fascinated? I just on loved that. that. Was what I knew. Okay. You know, I grew yeah. up in suburban Chicago. Sure. We watched Illinois. We watched Northwestern. We watched Wisconsin. We watched all you know every year in football. We always watched Ohio State, Michigan, because that was the game of the year that yeah. always determined who was going to go to the Rose Bowl. And the Rose Bowl was here. I oh, mean, that yeah. was the be all end all. You know, the, if the national championship came along, that's fine. But the Rose Bowl was the be all end all for a Big Ten mm-hmm. kid at my age. So I, you know, I'm applying to schools. I remember I applied to Kansas in a crayon, in purple crayon, <laughs> and got in. I did get in, and so that was, were, I was I was going to go to I was going to go to Kansas for a while. So yeah, and then finally I I, I got a I, I, Mrs. Vanoska, my English teacher, my junior year, wrote me one of the greatest recommendation letters that I've mm. ever seen, and um, it got me into Wisconsin. In fact, the counselor when I was at orientation said. You got in because of this. What'd she say? She just kind of sp- spelled out what I we have talked about, that I was a kid that moved from one high school to another right in the middle of midstream in high school and has acclimated myself to to, to integrate in not only athletically but socially. Uh, I wound up being student council president at my new high school, which was always kind of a leadership thing. I, I was student council president in my middle school and class president my freshman year. I always found that very important, you know, like very important. I wanted to be out there because I didn't want to be led by others. I wanted to lead either uh, collectively, and 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 that's that that was important to me. So that that kind of, I guess, she gave me a copy of it. I still have it, and, yeah. and that was that was a game changer for me. So I went to the University of Wisconsin, great school. Don't think I could get in there now. I know I couldn't get in there now with my grades because I see my kids applying for schools, and I'm like, holy cow! And and the price is. Like that, the other thing that's eye opening are the prices because I'm going through it right now. Yeah. It's like, holy cow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember dropping off the check for out of state tuition at the University of Wisconsin every semester was like 1500 bucks. No, it doesn't buy you. That buys you a couple of textbooks. Right? Yeah. It, it's, it, it is funny how, because obviously you and I went to college at the same time. It is insane. Yep. But I gave you a hard time earlier about, you know, not getting into Big Ten. Big Ten academically, not sure. easy to get into. Yeah. yeah. So another reason it was challenging. But you go to Wisconsin after coming from New Jersey and even Arlington Heights. It is not a big city, mm-hmm. you know, Madison. Mm-hmm. Were you a fish out of water or was it instantly, you know, you, you could relate to go it? Go back to sports. I joined a fraternity, met a group of guys. They were a big athletic house. We played a lot of sports, we played football, basketball, softball, the whole bit. And that, that kind of who's who I gravitated towards. And, and I think the team element really drew me. And you kind of fit in. You kind of find people that you kind of connect with. And that's that's what really happened. And those I, I tell my daughters, my oldest is going to be a sophomore at Nebraska, and I say, this is the best time of your life. I mean, yeah. I'm telling you right now. I know it sucks during exams, and I know it's tough to really navigate through these uh, social deals, but you will look back and go, wow, that was so much fun. Yeah. So much fun. You know, you, you obviously spent a lot of time in, in big markets. I mean, mm-hmm. Milwaukee um, was a, a market you worked in. But now you're in, obviously, and you were in Wisconsin. You started mm-hmm. there markets that are college markets what's the difference what did you feel was the main difference between those pro markets like milwaukee covering it as a sportscaster versus those college markets uh it's more structure i think um you know in the college markets i think it usually lend tends to be a little smaller too and so you do a lot more high schools too a lot more high school coverage which i actually enjoy very much um the professional versus the college is just, uh, you know, the pros are expected to talk and like it or not, they're going to have to answer questions where you can kind of shield kids at the college level, not as much anymore with uh, the changes and evolution of, 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 of things uh, and like in a whole yeah. bit. And uh, there's not as much control over the college um, athlete as there once was. But I think that's the biggest thing that the pro- professionals are professionals and they have to talk and, uh, if they don't feel like talking, they have to kind of uh, they have to they have to conduct themselves like professionals. Where college kids are college kids, and sometimes they can be a little immature at times. Right, but that's can be expected. Um, and I think that's the biggest biggest difference been covering. But you know, I covered games at you know Lambeau, almost every NFL stadium out there, and um, you know we treat Nebraska football just like they you know my old station treated Packers football. Mm-hmm. You know the difference is. In Milwaukee, when I was working in Milwaukee, we had the Packers, we had the Bucks, we had the Brewers, you know, and oh, we have Wisconsin football and basketball and Marquette basketball and, and that type of thing. So, um, you know, we had a PJ Tour event every year. We had a major uh, championship come in our area. We had uh, auto race, uh, Indy car race every year. So, yeah, and NASCAR came to town. So, um, in the market, so we had a lot of different options. We're in Omaha. 
Kingpin is Nebraska football, and then, you know, it's just such a separation between everything else. But, you know, Green Bay football to me, and I had a chance to go up to a game one time years ago, Mm -hmm. it felt like a college environment. Yeah. It didn't feel like, and I've been to other pro games, it felt just, I don't know, different. It felt like a pro game, whereas I felt like Green Bay was kind of like a college market. Would you? I agree with that, because I grew up going to Bears games, and it was just a different different crowd at Soldier Field. Mm-hmm. And you go to a Lam- game at Lambeau, and I know it's changed since I've left. I mean, shoot, it's been 13 years. But it is, you tailgate, you, you, you sing songs, you do the polka <laughs> in between, you know, I mean, yeah. stuff like that. You know, the guys jump into the stands after touchdowns. I mean, that's pretty cool. You don't get that at a lot of professional uh, stadiums. I think that's yeah. a big difference. Let's talk about perseverance, because you certainly showed it. You said you went two years. So here you, you graduate and you had to really mm. grind, as you put it, for two years before you fell into yeah. a job. There's a lot of people that would have said, I'm going to go do something else. I'm not going to wait this two years. What was a, what drove you to have that perseverance for those two years? I gave myself five years after graduation. I said, if I don't like where I'm at after five years after graduation, I'm done. Okay? I'll, I can't do five years. I'm young. I got, you know, I'm mobile. Yeah. So I gave myself five years. I got a job. I waited tables. Chili's. Became a like an on the road trainer, like one of those deals again, leadership position. Um, and that I really wanted to be a guy who kind of set the example, of, so to speak, at times. And um, and so that's really where I dove into. Uh, ma- that's where my money source came from. So um, I graduated in uh, you know May of ninety one, and then didn't get my first job until July of ninety three. So uh, that's a two-year, two-month period where I was waiting tables. I was uh, DJing fraternity sorority parties. I was uh, doing morning radio for this Wisconsin radio network uh, that I would string for. I was a freelancer. I'd have to wake up at 4 in the morning to do it. And, you know, I sometimes sleep at the office in between shifts. I mean, mm. it, was, mm. it was hard. But something just said, you know, if this is really what you want to do, you're going to give it your all. And if five years doesn't work out for you, then so be it. You, you gave it your all. And I, you don't have any regrets. But... You know, stuff happened in July of 93 where there was a change, and they I wasn't their first choice. I wasn't my wife's first choice. Yeah. I wasn't their first choice. I, I, you know, it's all right. It doesn't matter how you, how you get there as long as you get there, right? So I was, uh, I got this job at my, the station in Madison, WKOW. I was the number three guy making four and a quarter a day, an hour and uh, working like 20 hours a week, 25 hours a week, and it, I was in heaven. I was, you know, shooting in that fall happened to coincide with the same uh, first time uh, Wisconsin had gone to the Rose Bowl in like 30 years. And that was a magic, mm. like I got to shoot the games. It was amazing. I, I have to imagine, did you hear a lot of no's during that two oh years? Oh my gosh, or yes. You in did? fact, there was okay. a bar in Madison uh, that would uh, give you a free drink for every rejection letter you could bring in. <laughs> So it was. Uh, you know, so I, you were spending I, some time yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bucks, Bucks <laughs> Bar. I spent a lot of time at Bucks. Yes. Oh, well, they've taken it to a new level at Rocco's, haven't yeah. they? Oh, With yeah. The Jello shot. Yeah. How about that? Huh? That was somehow even the governor. Even the governor during their pep rally uh, at Alex Box when LSU returned home mentioned the Jello shots and congratulated <laughs> everybody for breaking a new record. Well, that? listen, you know, long backstory, but I was wearing a Florida shirt during yeah. this tournament, and I can promise you, I think I met everyone that had more than ten Jello shots from LSU. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of them. Yeah, there were. Hey, we're taking a little break in the show to make sure you know about Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland. Not many banks have been around for 139 years, but Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland has. And why? Because they offer full service business banking. And you'll always speak to a live human being when you give them a call at Farmers and Merchants Bank of Ashland. They're commercial lenders. They are more than happy to share their expertise and to help you navigate any business financing that you may need, including SBA, TIF, or NEDCO financing. So go to fmnb.com. Right below me, you're going to see that website or give them a call at 402 944 Three three one six. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Let's now switch gears just a little bit here because um, you end up, of course, here in Omaha, mm. and it's been an incredible run at KETV. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've learned at watching KETV is you guys have an incredible team. Mm. I mean, you and Julie Cornell, Bill Ranby, Rob McCartney, the four of you have a chemistry that 
I just don't see it. Even when I go and travel and I watch, you know, bigger markets, I don't see that chemistry between the anchors like I do at KETV. Was that, in t- do you have to work at that? Was it just innate? I think it was, I think it's organic. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, and we're friends. That's the, and I think it shows, um, you know, we go to our kids' graduation parties. We, we hang out, we'll go out to dinner, um, uh, we truly like each other. You know, Bill and Julie are married, if people didn't realize that. Yeah. I mean, um, and they've got a wonderful family, and, uh, and, and, and Rob's wife, Sherry, I mean, she's always in the station now because uh, his kids are grown now. So um, it, it, we just truly like each other. They're, 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 they're like family. You spend so much time at the station, probably as much time at the station than you do at home. I mean, that's how much that local television is a tough deal. And so it'd be miserable, A, if you did, if you were working with a bunch of jerks, uh, but B, it, 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 we do really like each other, and I think that that's so helpful. And, and, and it's good to the point. They're like family members because you, you can jab them. Like, I can jab Bill, and Bill can jab me, <laughs> and Julie can jab me, and I can, you know, it, it goes back and forth. And Rob, you know, Rob can jab everybody. It's, it's kind of fun. Well, that's, that's when fun. you know you have a great relationship, yeah, right? Yeah. It's, like, it's like the buddies I golf with on Sunday Yeah, yeah, morning. yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. you know you're yeah. going to hear it. You're going to hear about yeah. that one time or blah, blah, blah. And it, 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 but you expect it. And, and, I ho- and, I, and I think that we're at the level now where you're comfortable. It took a couple years because I was – I'm the young guy, and I've been at the station for 13 years, Right. So I think the longevity and stability helps for in that regard, for sure. Well, you know, I, I've heard so many stories about you leading all the way, going back to when you were in early days of high school. But I think that something that people can learn is that, that power of leading laterally, right? Mm. Just because you don't have owner or president of the company uh, behind your name, leading laterally. And I want to tell you a story. I, I had an early morning flight. Very early morning. I was at the airport probably about 4.30, and the gates weren't even open. And Jonah Gilmore, one oh, of your yeah, reporters, yeah. was there. Jonah, yeah. And I recognized him, and so I went up, and we started chatting and, and just random stuff. But one of the things that he just brought up without any kind of prompting from me is that he feels like you and Rob and Julie and Bill have been great mentors to him. And he didn't talk about you guys leading. He just talked about kind of your your servant leadership mm. that you guys just kind of naturally have. But to me, one of the things that struck me was the reason KETV has dominated the ratings for years is that there's there's a real team frame, uh, framework there. Mm. And what I heard from Jonah was more than anything is that you guys take these guys under their wings because at the end of the day, one, you're good people, mm. but two, that really helps the team. And I wonder if, again, is that... Is that something that's you know consciously thought of, or, or is it just more of, of your personality? Well, that's nice to hear. I didn't know that, but uh, yeah, Jonah's a, a great guy, and he's thrilled that LSU won the national championship. <laughs> yeah, he's, I forgot him. He was going known. to New Orleans yeah, yeah. that morning, and it's interesting too because I don't get to spend much time with Jonah or many of the morning people who I, I love dearly. Uh, uh, but um, I think for Jonah, he. Uh, obviously the natural gravitation is towards Rob and Julie. And I know Rob and Julie both go out of their way to mentor uh, the news people. I obviously have a great staff with uh, Matt Foster and Ellie French. Right. And, you know, I try to do my best to, 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 to show them the way. And Bill, he's got a, a great group of uh, meteorologists that he works with. So, but yet I think when, when people see how you act and I, I kind of have to remind myself at times because these are long days and your frustrations and your patience run thin and I'm not. I I've noticed that the older I get, the less patient I am. And my my, my wife reminds <laughs> me of it all the, the time. I know. <laughs> what so took you so the, long? <laughs> the littlest things can set me off. But um, you know, the bottom line is like just do your job, work hard, and have some fun along the way. That's that's the thing that I've always kind of kind of hung my hat on. Yeah. So, it, well, it's interesting to hear that though. It, it really is. And I just think you know, from I, I, look, whether you're in business or whether you're you're doing something uh, in sports casting. I think that ability to, to have that team framework mm-hmm. is so important. And, and I guess, let me, let me take it to a, new, a different place. Is that why KETV has been so successful? Because people get that sense. I mean, it really does look like a fine-tuned machine, a, a, a team working together. I think that's there's multiple layers there. Uh, but I, I think the, the bottom line is that we have some stability. And obviously, we've got talented leaders in Rob and Julie and Bill. I mean, everybody knows local news is driven by local weather, too. So you got to give props to Bill and his crew. But, uh, you know, I, I do think that stability helps. 
And even though we've had drastic turnovers in terms of a lot of reporters and producers who have turned over, especially since COVID has been tough mm-hmm. on everybody. But I think um, our, I, I'd be remiss without mentioning our boss, Vaughn Jones, who has been at KTV forever. You know, uh, Vaughn is our news director, and he he's the guy that steadies the ship. Um, he's the one constant through all these changes. And so he's the guy that makes it run. Yeah. And um, we've added newscasts. We've done a lot of things that that uh, kind of that's the way the business is evolving, and and sometimes it's not perfect, um, but you know with with the guiding hands that we have up 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 in leadership roles, I think that really is is crucial in this time because everybody's you know doing more with less, mm-hmm. you know, and and everything's go 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 because it's, the people don't wait around until six o'clock or ten o'clock to get the news; they can go on their phones and find it. So why would they, you know? So we have to make people give people reason to watch, and that's yeah. important. Look, I'm not just trying to pat you on the back, yeah. but but we're yeah, <laughs> we are. I'm not quite done with this because. Part of what we do here is is I think it's important for people to know if they're a business owner, business leader, or again, working anywhere, mm-hmm. the importance of that, uh, of, of leadership lessons. One is servant leadership. And one of the, the things you said to me when we first met uh, a year ago at the state basketball games, you said to me, hey, if you ever need anything, mm-hmm. we, we talked for three minutes. And you mm-hmm. said, if you ever need anything, let me know. Yeah. So I'm curious, where did that come from, that ability to serve people? Because, mm-hmm. again, you could have big time me. You've earned that right. You yeah. could have walked on by, but you yeah. said, hey, if you ever need something, give me yeah. a call. Um, what do you think influenced you? Well, I think my parents, for one, and then later in life, Jay Wilson, the, one of my best friends, who we still talk to. We're in the same fantasy baseball league, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, he, I, I learned so much from him just the way he conducted himself in public because everybody knew him. He was in the market for 30, 40 years, you know, yeah. in Madison. And um, and that's something I, you know, if you say something too, follow up on it too. So like, you know, hey, if you ever needed anything, let me know. That That's not blowing smoke. If you do, just just let me know. If I can, I, I will certainly help you. If I can, I can't. You know, that's part right. of the deal. But I, I do think that um, some of that too is uh, the, the lessons that you learn from people that you work with, and then you try to instill that into your group. So with my my people, which is Matt and Ellie, and before that, Matt Lothrop and Thor Tripp and Steve Henneberry, um, I always say that I don't ask them to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Now, my role is different than their roles, obviously. Mm-hmm. But when it comes down to it, on Friday nights, I'm going to have to shoot some high school football games. I get that. And it's tough. you got to kind of juggle a lot of things. But if I'm not willing to do that, how can I ask them to do that. And that's always been kind of a big thing for me. Um, now, I, I I would prefer, you know, like Matt's out shooting a story when we're when we're recording this, right? I mean, it's just impossible. You can work, you can literally work 24 hours a day in this business, and you're going to burn yourself out. And mm-hmm. I am, you know, obviously, I've, I've come close to the burnout stage, no doubt. And some would argue I'm already over the top. But <laughs> It is. It is. You, you you have to learn balance, and you have to. But you also have to learn what's important and focus on the things that are important. But I would not ask my 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 guys and gal to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Hiring. Let's talk about that mm-hmm. because you've hired, as you mentioned, the names you just reeled off. Excellent mm-hmm. people. What what is paramount in your opinion when you're looking at the person to hire? Uh, uh, well. One, I don't do the hiring, which is, I got to say that right away. I can have some influence and say, hey, I like person A, B, or C, but I don't get to choose A, B, or C. That's, uh, that's, uh, those, those are What have you above. seen that has been? But I will seen. say that what I look for is, I, I probably can't say it, but give a... Yeah, yeah. Give a... You have to care. Yeah. If you don't have... You can't teach give a... You can't teach that give a rats. You know, you got you to gotta care. And you can tell on a resume reel... Who cares and who doesn't? A great uh, friend of mine who was uh, one of my bosses in Milwaukee used to say, Andy, there are in this business, there are two kinds of people. There are workhorses and there are show horses. And he said, you, my friend, are a workhorse. And that we need workhorses in this business, especially now more than ever. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing is that ability to care. I mean, it ties right into really, I think, the values and, and the culture. Yeah. Because if I you don't care, air. why show up? If you don't have passion, I, I'm good. I, I, you're good. I can find people who care. And I can teach them how to do the job. But if you don't care, if you don't have that passion, yeah. maybe you should find something else, right? 
It's a good segue into my next question because look, you've won an Oscar, I think is what yeah, they proud yeah. Omaha Sports oh, yeah, Commission. Think, yeah. You won an Oscar. You have been a uh, sportscaster of the year twice. Mm-hmm. Uh, back to back years, by the way, yeah, didn't yeah, happen often. Fun. So yeah, that, yeah. that's that's. I've been back since though. I'm still working to it. Still working. <laughs> well, we're going to start right now yeah. the campaign. Yeah, today there we go. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, obviously, you have the ability to connect with people. But when I think about that, you know, obviously, skill set is important. Yeah, I have skills, but. You also have to have that ability to connect and be likable and and people want, you know, they have to gravitate towards you. So when you think about that and you go back, is that more important than the skill set or is the skill set in this business more important than that ability oh. to be liked and connect oh. and all that? I think that's a great question. I think they go hand in hand. Um in this day and age, you got to give people a reason to watch. Mm-hmm. If you don't give people a reason to watch, they've got attention spans like this. They've got five different options at their fingertips that they can watch something else. So why are they going to watch you? You got to give them something to watch. And a lot of it has to do with consistency and, and excellence of uh, what you're doing every night. And yeah, of course, it's never going to be perfect. But I, I think the, the, the ability to connect with viewers is very important. And I think it goes back to what we were saying, not just connecting on the air, looking at the camera, but also connecting with other people. And I think that comes across, you know, like um, I had a great compliment on uh, one of the stories we just did with Cam Koshal, who's a baseball player from Millard South. I saw that. And and he he made this um, the U18 national team. So he played for Team USA, which allowed him to get a baseball card. Uh, made by Panini, and he's in this set that's currently out now. And one of the things I wanted to do with him was just do something different. Now, going back to our earlier conversation, this is something that Tim Weigel would do back in Chicago, back in the day. They had baseball cards back then. So I bought a box of baseball cards, you know, and I surprised him. I said, hey, do you know what this is? And he was like, oh, my God, yes, of course I know what those are. And so we sat in the dugout at Millard South and opened baseball cards. That was one of my favorite stories I've done this year, just because he's human. He's not this superstar baseball player who's going to go high in the draft probably in the first three rounds coming up he's just this kid who's graduated from college who's terrific or graduated from high school who, who just happens to be terrific at baseball but at the core he's just a kid who likes yeah. to you know who, yeah. who likes baseball uh, and i and i by the way i saw a great story oh yeah it was, um, fun. it was fun to do oh and you know this is the other thing i think is interesting about the industry that you're in right now is there is disruption everywhere uh-huh. i mean oh yeah like you said there weren't many jobs when you got started mm-hmm. in this industry now you know Guys like me who can do a podcast, not that we're competing no, with no, no. in that area, but anyone with a camera can start doing, you know, interviews and following sports. So f- we, we say your industry disrupted. The truth of the matter is a lot of industries are disrupted sure. anymore. But how do you make sure that you stay above that? How do you make sure that that you don't let that affect you? Well, you're right. The, the industry has changed. You can just look around at any Nebraska post-practice interview session for football, and there are... Almost, I mean, dozens, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing 50 people. Yeah. I mean, which back in the day, there was three, four, you know, maybe two or three beat writers and a camera or two. You know, now it's just a different game because everybody, there's so many different media outlets. It's not just the local station. It's not just the local paper. I think the important thing is to, to, to keep showing up and keep doing great work. And if you keep doing that, I mean, we are blessed in Omaha to have um, a great leadership that we can continue to give a, a great product because it's not easy. I mean, I know that the staff at KETV, number-wise, is a little different than the staff at WOWT and the staff at Channel 3. It's just part of the deal. And mm-hmm. 42 just dropped out of the local thing a few years ago, and now they're completely out because the, they, they're just gone national news. And we get it. The landscape is changing. But you just have to, A, know what's going on around you, B, deliver a good product, and C, hopefully give people a reason to watch every night. Any idea what it'll look like, the industry, in 10 I, years? I, I, we had this conversation over a couple Diet Cokes over the weekend. <laughs> and, I'll uh, bet. And, and we we don't – that's a great question and the, uh, the million-dollar question because um, – is there going to be a six and ten o'clock news? Uh, will you will you tape a newscast at six and roll it roll it over roll it over on a on a media stream or or whatever? Um, will you do a traditional live newscast at ten o'clock? Uh, maybe maybe not. Will there be one sports entity that will distribute a sports cast to local affiliates and say, hey, you pay us X amount and we will produce this sports cast and it can be in market Lincoln. It can be market Sioux city. It can be out in Hastings. It can be in North Platte because Nebraska is one of these states that really you cover the Huskers. You pretty much can tip it off. You, you pretty much 
everything else is gravy after that point. Yeah. You know, you got to you got to cover the Nebraska stuff, and you know, to an, a, a bigger, uh, a, a, not a lesser extent. That's the wrong way of putting it. Huskers are here, but you still got to hit the high schools hard. That matters. Uh, volleyball matters. Creighton hoops matters. Nebraska hoops matters. Nebraska anything really matters. But and um, you know Creighton volleyball, Nebraska volleyball. You know and and now college baseball obviously is a huge deal. And oh by the way, Nebraska softball is going to be a big deal. My goodness. I mean it, it has it, been a a, a, yeah. a a big deal. I don't mean to belittle it, but now Jordan Ball being that that's going to be like appointment television. You you think those first few games, you know, first few games this past year, you know, they're playing non-conference on a Tuesday afternoon. I'm like, ah, Big Ten Plus is covering this. Let's just roll on that stream. Uh-uh. That's not going to be that way no. next year. And they, they, they've talked about adding bleachers. Not yeah. going to be enough, is yeah, it? I yeah, know. It's not going to be enough. It's crazy. They only hold 2,500, and there's 2,500 on the wait list right now. Yeah. So. You know, it, it, and only in Nebraska. And it's interesting you bring this up. I was listening to a podcast the other day. And uh, they talked about Stanford football. Mm -hmm. One beat writer from mm -hmm. San Jose Mercury News covering Stanford football. But Nebraska, like you said, volleyball matters, football. How special of a market is it from a sports perspective? Oh, I think it's truly unique. And um, I, think, I think some people don't realize how great of a sports market Omaha is. I know people from outside don't because uh, – because I get questions all the time, like, what do you cover other than Nebraska football? And you're like, hold on here. Like, there are so many different things that we cover, whether it's the College World Series or high school. The, the way we play up high schools is unique. Not every market does it the same way. They might do high school football big on Friday night, but do they cover basketball? Do they cover the high school volleyball uh, the way we do? do they, you know, uh, Do they cover the baseball championships, which have been great, and that wonderful move to the uh, Anderson Field at UNO? And that's been a yes. great, great move, in my opinion. So um, it's just a unique deal. There's always something going on. There's, there, there hasn't been a day uh, that you go, oh, what am I going to run today? You know, like I already know in my head when I was driving over here, I'm like, I got A, B, C, and D. And if I need it, I got E. You know what I mean? Right. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There is plenty of work for sh without a doubt. Now, let's put you to work in a different way. All right. I want to get some thoughts uh, on some names here, of right. some some sports casters and Folks that I guarantee you know. So give me your thoughts when I say Chris Berman. What hit you? Oh, well, he's he was one of my uh, influences early. He, he, and he, you know, what for, about it? How did he influence I just, you? I just think that he was one of the first guys to really um, the, like make trademark sayings and, and people that like, he was one of the first guys that you would want to like repeat his sayings. If something happened in your game or something happened in your wiffle ball game or your pickup football game, you would say he could go all the way. And you didn't do that with a lot of the national guys. He was one of the first unique national guys that people gravitated towards. And he, he, he was a big influence. Oh my yeah. goodness. And you know what? Just, he still got it. I yeah. don't know if you saw that clip yeah. with he and Xander Shoffley no. the other day. Yeah, no, And I he's introduced Xander Shoffley as Xander killing me soft, <laughs> softly with your song. And I don't think Xander That's Shoffley great. had any idea well, what no, song because Roberta he, Flack. Berman right? wasn't, you know, by the time that primetime was appointment television. Yeah. And now, you know, they put primetime on ESPN plus. So yeah, that's interesting that because these kids these days, they just don't, it, it's just, a different world. It's yeah. a different world. All right. How about Kim Pavelka? Now, this might not be a name oh, yeah. that influenced you as no, much no. because you were in Wisconsin. Right. But, it, but he's a legend, no yeah. question. And he's another guy who, when you listen to him now, he's sharp as a tack. And uh, I love the fact that he has, when he says certain things, you know what's going on. And yeah. and he, he's a beaut. And there's a, um, I always say that there is a, a instant respect with longevity. Like you can see, you know, I don't know Kent very well, but I know him well enough to know that he's pretty darn good to be around for this long, many years. And he's one of the best. Well, you talk about longevity. How about this guy, Vin Scully? Oh, yeah. He was your a, thoughts on uh, him. Oh, he was, he was, he's the standard bearer of baseball um, announcers. And, um, he had a way to paint a picture, right? I mean, yeah. he would. He, if you just listen to him, I prefer. I listen to even now. I've got the app on my radio or on my radio, my, my uh, on my cell phone that I can get all the games. So on, on the way home, I'll either a listen to a podcast or be a late game on the West Coast. And uh, Vin was before he retired. Yeah. I would listen to him on my way home from work, yeah. and he it was something else. Terrific. Complete poetry, in yep. my opinion, with baseball. Yep. How about a guy named Kevin Kugler? Oh, Kugler! What are your thoughts on Kugler? He is. I mean, uh, he he is outstanding in fact you know you mentioned the sportscaster of the year award i mean i i said when i won it i said it's finally nice to win the kevin kugler award 
because <laughs> he's the standard bearer in this state he is. and really uh, couldn't be a more genuine fella uh, away from everything. If you needed anything during the pandemic, we had him on multiple times just to just to talk sports and just, you know, because remember, during the pandemic, we didn't, there was nothing going on. So we just, you know, we would uh, we would do a Zoom every once in a while to, to, to keep things, keep the ball in the air, so to speak. Uh, and what a uh, talk about a grinder. I mean, that guy, his schedule, mm. oh, my goodness. I don't know when he, he sleeps. I know. And he earns every penny. He's doing uh, midweek basketball games, NFL football games. Um, you know, Westwood One on the radio. He might be on Fox. He might be on Westwood One for baseball. You know, the guy is – I mean, he really is truly one of the best. Yeah, no I think he is completely underrated And, and on he's one of those guys level. who could, when yeah. you mentioned, he could big time. Yeah, he, yeah. But he doesn't. He is as nice of a guy. Off, I mean, he is a genuine. When we see him on the road, if he's doing a Husker game or whatever, oh my goodness, it's just like yeah, he he because he's one of us. He is one of yeah, us, yeah. no question. Well, how about uh, you were looking live, Brent Musburger? You are looking live. He was well, and here's the other thing that people don't realize: NFL uh, NFL Today was one of the pregame shows. It was the pregame show that created pregame That was shows. Can't Miss TV yeah. on Sundays, Herb wasn't Cross, it? Yeah. Phyllis George. Yes. Jimmy the Greek. Jimmy the Greek. Yeah, it would do the predictions. That, and that, think about that. It was, what, 40 years ago, and he's putting up check marks, but he couldn't really talk about betting, but he's talking about betting, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, but Musburger was... A, Terrific, uh, terrific! Like when he, uh, I, one of my uh, big achievements on Twitter is that he followed me. I'm sure he doesn't. I'm sure he's got a staff. But this was like five years ago when he went out to do the Raiders stuff, and I'm like, oh my God, Brett Musburger <laughs> followed me. And like took up screenshots. Same I way when Andy like, Kindy followed me. <laughs> yeah, I mean I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I love it. I love it. Some great ones. Um, listen, you got to give me one or two great broadcasting stories. Some crazy story from broadcasting out of the back of a pickup, or uh, well, or yeah, I've, I've done that. <clears throat> On a broadcasting games yeah. and uh, folding ta- uh, on a dugout before, just sitting on a dugout because we didn't have a chair. Or <laughs> Probably a no table. screen to protect. Yeah, nothing. No, yeah. no, no. You're out on. You're out on. You're out on your own. Uh, you, you did mention Dancing with the Stars. I'll yes, tell you that. So, I gotta hear okay, this. so Milwaukee, um, we were big on tying in local affiliate uh, programming. So with the national uh, broadcast, uh, ABC would show. We would try to tie in. Like did something with uh, our sports director just had to sit down with Regis when it was who wants to be a millionaire. Did that type of thing. Yeah. So Dancing with the Stars first hit. It was. Season two, I think Emmett Smith was in the was in one of the That's final right. four or whatever, and they won said, it. Hey, didn't yeah, he? yeah, well, he did. But they said, "Hey, he's a football guy, Andy. Why don't you? Would you be interested?" And they were kind of toying with me, maybe moving me to the mornings to be the morning show guy. And so they put me and my my buddy Ivan, my my photographer, and we went out to Los Angeles, stayed at three different hotels and three different nights because nobody had any idea what they were doing. They said, oh, we'll just put you up in Los Angeles. Well, this is nowhere near this. So we finally get to the day where it's the finals and it's Emmett Smith and uh, Mario Lopez. So and we're on the red carpet deal because they do this little media line after everything is done. And uh, Emmett Smith wins. And he wins, uh, obviously, a bigger name. And, and so uh, Mario Lopez is probably the better dancer. But he loses, yeah. and he's and he's, and he's, t- <laughs> he's he's angry. And his dancing partner, the professional, Karina, Katrina Smirnoff, is with him. And we're doing the, you know, hey, you know. And, and then I say, and, and Mario gives me an answer like, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's not about who's the better dancer. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, I, I kind of like, oh, you know, I'm kind of having fun with it. And then the, the Katrina Smirnoff girl kind of puts her shoulder in. And she said, let me tell you and you and you, there is no way that that man is a better dancer than that man. <laughs> And so on the live shot later that night, it was like an hour later, I said, bitter party of two, your table's now available. So that's, that, that was a good one. That is yeah. a great lead yeah. into that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So you ran it. You yeah, ran yeah. It. Oh, yeah, I ran it. That was the best stuff. I mean, there, you know, the rule in broadcasting, if it's a, if it's a, good, if it's a great soundbite, you got to run it, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, yeah. The thing that, that's the thing. Like, you're, you're going through, you know, a bunch of different sound bites, and it's like, well, what makes your, what makes your eyebrows go, hmm, or makes your ears perk up? And that's usually what I listen for, whether it be a Dancing with the Stars or Husker football, and you're like, oh, well, that's interesting. Let's see if we can work that in. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, listen, we're going to have a little more fun here. I call these... We're out of here because we're going to end up with kind of a couple of random questions for you, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. So the movie's been written. It's now called The Life and Times of Andy Kindy. Oh, boy. Spielberg, they've, they've announced he's, he's directing. Yeah, so it, it's oh, looking it's good. Okay, okay. Uh, but now we got to do casting. <laughs> Who is playing 
Andy Kindy on uh, this. I like Denzel Washington. He's a badass, <laughs> but uh, I don't think he, he would. He, I don't know. If he that, can do anything. Yeah, he can. He really can do. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Matt Damon. I like Matt Damon. He could probably fit into the Andy Kendi role. Obviously, he he proved that he could gain a little weight on air, <laughs> so he he fit right in. So Matt Damon, how about a little go Matt Damon? I like Matt. Damon. I would Damon. like yeah. to say Brad Pitt, but that's not realistic. <laughs> Matt Damon's more my guy. All right, another one here. Nil deal. You are a look. It sounds like you were pretty close to being a heavily recruited D one athlete yeah. out of New Jersey. Maybe, <laughs> the, maybe that. No, yeah. yeah. So NIL is running rampant, uh-huh. and and everyone wants you. Alabama wants you. Georgia wants you. So you get to pick your NIL deal, whatever it is. What okay. are you picking? Well, if I was at Wisconsin, there was a burrito place called La Bamba, and they had burritos <laughs> as big as your head. And so that's where I would gravitate because there was plenty of nights after, after uh, let's say, just after the clock struck midnight that I would find myself in line eating a big burrito as big as my head. La Bamba. <laughs> and they had they had different locations. They were a big, big 10 uh, restaurant. They had one in Illinois and one in Indiana. So, yeah, I don't know if they oh, still that, exist you, anymore. I see this. This is kind of yeah, spinning for yeah, you a little yeah, bit. La Bamba. Yeah, La Bamba. La Bamba burritos. <laughs> In fact, I miss those days. I didn't feel great the next day, but at least going down, it went well. Oh, listen, yeah. I, I I shouldn't do this to you, but my last one, because okay. this is called three and we're out of Uh-oh. here. You you have a big night game in Madison okay. that you can attend, 50-yard line seats, yeah. and you're going as a fan. Oh, Big night game, rare. number one versus number two, or a big night game in Memorial Stadium, 50-yard line seats. Which game? I, you can think, only pick one, same I would, night. No, I would think I would go to Memorial Stadium, and here's why. I've been to one Nebraska game as a fan, 2000, and it was Nebraska Baylor. And my wife and I, she's like, "You've never been to a game. Let's go to a game." And so we, pre- before we had kids, and we, we, and a guy was with his uh, crying son, and they were leaving. He says he can't handle this. I, I, just face value, typical Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> and face value, I think it was forty bucks or whatever to get into the thing. And and it was a great. I mean, they kicked the crap out of Baylor. Uh, Monte Cristo was the quarterback. I still remember. And and but that's it. We sat in the, uh, the south end zone, uh, and. Um, and that was no North End Zone, North End Zone, and that was it. So I would definitely go to Memorial Stadium because I've never really been to a game as that a fan. first game. What would jumped out at you? I mean, what, uh, why I, was I it so think, special? A the the friendliness of the fans, uh, and and the uh, B the collectiveness of purpose. Like everybody was on board. Like I, you know, I'm I'm used to Wisconsin where half the student section shows up mid second Dude, quarter. You late. know, there's there is there's empty things because everybody's still getting lathered up, as Barry Alvarez would once say. I I, I just think it's um, amazing how a uh, and how, how 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 serious people take this, and it's it's part of the fabric and when people say you kind of roll your eye but you know it is truly part of the fabric of the state of nebraska's football and how and how they're doing it's the talking point it's it's not the weather at the water cooler it's who's going to play quarterback or what happened last week or hey what do you think we need to do better defensively and it's not just middle-aged dudes it's everybody yeah. it's the secretary it's the it's the you know the the grocery lady uh, the, the checker out or person at the grocery checker at the baker's you know it's it, an IV or whatever and it is amazing how much people uh know how knowledgeable they are and how invested they are and that that's what struck me right uh, that that day and whether it be pre-game Post game, I mean, you know, people party. No, no question. I mean, that's part of the deal. It's an escape. It's the way they spend their Saturdays, and I hope we never lose that. Um, I know there's going to be challenges moving forward uh, with the renovation of the stadium, uh, but the thing that will keep you coming back is if they put a good product on the air. And I think we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, and you know what? I got to throw a bonus question out, and I've asked a few of my guests this one in the three and out of here. What do you think? I mean, is Nebraska going bowling sooner rather than later? Sure. Is it a bigger? Okay. Yeah. So what and you just, seen? Yeah, from what I've seen, and, and here's why, and I know that the it, some of the recruiting stuff has opened my eyes. Like, he truly, uh, Matt Rule is truly recruiting guys that are off the radar. Like, some guys that had, he, they got a guy this past week that uh, had a, uh, offers from Montana, Montana State. Now, granted, this kid was a legacy, but... Um, I think that they have a different way of evaluating kids that obviously has worked in his previous stops in college. So I think, you know, this year will be telling to see the foundation of his culture and his um, the way he goes about week to week, because we don't know how he deals with the season. Let's see what happens after a tough loss. How right. does he handle that? Because um, he's not going to win them all. We know that. But I think that just the organization... Uh, I have been blown away. You know, we got to talk to to Coach Rule a couple weeks ago, one on one, and it was really telling to know like his staff is they are 
They know, he's, he knows where he's got to be every second of every day, yeah. and he maximizes every day. That's the other thing. He maximizes every day. I know you've got a lot of stories to get to, but I, yes, you and Rob McCartney sat down with him. Yeah. One last question. I no, promise. No, 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 I'm no, letting it's you good. go after no, this. No, I got you. You, you just keep spurring good. ideas here in my head, but his availability, his uh, mm-hmm. the ability to access him and get to him. You guys sat down, did a great, put it on Chronicle on Sunday, but- what is that like? Do you feel a difference as well? Because he seems to be everywhere. I, I, yeah, and, and it was interesting because in a group setting, he's, you know, it's almost, um, it was a little intimidating to meet him for the, like, you know, obviously we've met him before, but just to sit down because you sure. want to make a good impression because you know you're going to have to work with this this guy for hopefully years, you know? And um, my impression for him is he is a professional. Like, there's a reason he made it to the NFL. And there's some life lessons there, too, because sure. he did not succeed in the NFL, and he's the first to admit that. Right. But I think what he learned in the – a few of the things that he's learned in the NFL about uh, accessibility uh, with the media, I think that's important. And that's something that maybe we didn't have in the last few years. And, and any time that you, you, you prop up the new guy, this is not necessarily a knock on the previous guy. It's just what I'm seeing, and what I'm seeing is a guy who knows how to deal with the media, at least at this point. Now, granted, they're, they haven't lost a game, and there hasn't been any – controversial things but at this point he's doing everything right yeah. and I, I i've got to tip my hat to him whether it be himself or his staff the outreach is off the charts his ability to connect with kids at his camps and we're seeing the 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 fruits of that by just look at who is committed to nebraska moving forward and that's that's pretty impressive what he's been able to do in such a short time now it may not result in wins this year but I do think that they uh, will contend for a bowl this year. Mm-hmm. And I do think that uh, they'll get over that six-win hump, no question. And I think that that's just the start for this guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's exciting. And I'll tell you what, I knew we'd get a lot out of this. Speaking of a guy that could connect, Andy Kendi, you have obviously done that and then some. And it's been fun watching on Channel 7. And thanks for doing this today. Thanks for having me. It's been a, it's been a joy. It kind of took me down memory lane a little bit. That was great. You got it. Yeah.